first time I remember to do that before I've started. Uh, all right. Okay. I think uh, we'll let people in as they as they filter in, and we'll get started. So we can get started right on time here. Um, so first and foremost, hey, everybody, and thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name is Mikhail Kowalski. I'm the vice chair of JSpace Canada. Uh, at JSpace Canada, our vision, our vision is a future of self-determination and sovereignty for Jews and Palestinians in Israel-Palestine, championed by Canadian Jews. We aim to shift the conversation around Israel-Palestine from our political institutions to our Shabbat tables. And we believe that the way to do that is exactly what we are doing right now. So it's coming together, it's finding community, it's having these conversations. Before we get started today, I do wanna to acknowledge that this event is taking place on the ancestral homelands of indigenous peoples across Canada, caretakers and stewards of this land for time immemorial, each with their own unique traditions, languages, and history. Um, I'm going to give a few housekeeping notes here. So as you likely noticed, we're recording this session. Um, we share everything on YouTube. The recording only picks up spotlighted speakers, but if you are concerned, you're more than welcome to turn off your camera. Uh, the reason we have everybody here uh, kind of as, uh, as a meeting as opposed to a webinar is that we, um, we really value conversation. We really value being able to see each other and ask questions of one another. And today's event is actually gonna be even more interactive because we have David who I'll introduce uh, shortly. Um, he's gonna be giving us a virtual tour. So instead of like a talking head style interview, um, he's just gonna be showing us around and, and we'll give him share a screen ability to be able to do that. So um, really I, uh, I think, David, I think this is, this is how I've done other tours with you before, so I don't think I'm out of line to say, if you have any questions of anything that he's showing you on the maps as we go forward, you can just unmute yourself and simply ask a question. Um, if you feel a little too Canadian to do that today, um, you're also welcome to put your question in the chat and I can just ask it on your behalf. Um, and just the final housekeeping note is that uh, I do want to ask that everyone is respectful of our speaker and of your fellow attendees. We have a zero tolerance policy on all of our webinars and events for racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, anti-Palestinian racism, or otherwise hateful language. Um, our tour today is going to take us to some of the flashpoint areas within Israel and the occupied West Bank that we hear about the most in the news. Um, this virtual tour has been created by Israel Policy Forum, and we're so grateful to have their CEO, David Halpern, here with us today to bring us kind of as on the ground as we can get as we're half a world away through this amazing technology. Uh, Israel Policy Forum works to shape the discourse and more mobilize support among American Jewish leaders and U.S. policymakers for the realization of a viable two-state solution. They do this by educating political and communal leaders on pragmatic policy ideas developed by credible experts. And a bit about David before we get started. David is the CEO of Israel Policy Forum and was instrumental in the rebirth of Israel Policy Forum's work in 2012, expanding the organization's work by creating innovative partnerships with an array of policy and communal organizations nationwide. He has previously worked as a Middle East policy analyst at the Center for American Progress and as a reporter for Haaretz English Edition in Israel. He has an MPA with a focus on international relations from Columbia University School of International Public Affairs, where he was a member of the International Fellows Program. He is a founding board member of the Sala Treatment and Research Foundation. He has a BA in political science and Judaic studies from the University of Arizona. He's originally from Phoenix, Arizona, and now lives with his wife and two kids in Riverdale, New York. David, welcome, and thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Maytal. Good to be with you again. Uh, thanks to uh, to all of you for joining. Um, I love your comments about don't be too Canadian, um, or uh, if you feel Canadian, you should chat. Uh, I just want to reiterate what Maytal said. Anytime during today's presentation, uh, please feel free to interrupt me, and if uh, you do put it in the chat, I'll ask Maytal to flag it for me. Um, uh, not knowing the kind of background of everyone, I want to just give a brief overview, if that's all right, Maytal, of the right. current situation in the West Bank today. Very, very brief. Um, and then we'll jump into some of the more specific developments that are currently taking place and take a look at some of the drone photography um, and get acclimated to some of the issues uh, that are currently uh, in the news. So just a very, very quick uh, recap of where we are at. 
Um, you all can see my screen now, uh, I believe. Yes, um, great. Um, just as a reminder, today we're talking about the West Bank um, indicated here by the green line, um, often referred to as the 67 lines or the 48, 49 armistice line, uh, indicating the line between Israel and then Transjordan between 40 nine and 67. So we're talking here today about the West Bank. And of course, since 1995, with uh, um, the signing of the Oslo Accords and the implementation of the, uh, uh, of, of the Oslo Accords, the area has been, uh, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> distinguished into three different sections. Uh, area A, which you can see on this map in red, area B in orange, and area C is the remaining area that is not highlighted, but you can see the area of the built up area of Israeli settlements, of Jewish uh, settlements in the West Bank that are, that are the areas that you see in blue. Uh, that is not to say that area C is, is just those areas in blue. Area C is actually 60% of the West Bank. And as you can see in the breakdown on this slide, uh, area A and B, 18% uh, 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 and 22% accordingly. Today, we have roughly 2.8 million Palestinians um, and about 465,000 Israelis. This is a older number. Uh, in nearly 130 settlements and far more outposts, which we'll discuss what outposts are uh, and the current controversy surrounding them uh, in just a moment. Um, so roughly what we're saying is that today there is about 84%, 85% of the population in the West Bank uh, is a Palestinian population. Um, it's also notable, uh, uh, we're going to talk a bit today about transportation routes and the controversy around uh, various routes of transportation. And I've highlighted here on this map the route of Route 60. Uh, the Route 60 is the major highway that sits, um, you could say, on, on the backbone of the West Bank. Uh, this is the high point of the mountain ridge. Um, it is, uh, goes dramatically into the valley, the, Jor the Jordan Valley here to the east, and then, of course, dramatically uh, into the plains uh, the coastal plain uh, to the west. So we're really sitting on a, a kind of mountain ridge where Route 60 sits, Route 60 connecting all of the major population centers from Janine in the north to Hebron in the south, including passing through Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. We'll talk about Route 60 quite a lot during today's presentation um, and just to orient yourself uh, around the map. Any questions on this sort of basic landscape of where we are at today before we jump into some of the current pressing issues. And feel free to, at any point, you have questions. Okay, cool. All right, so I'm gonna share another screen. Give me just one moment. And we'll jump into the, the drone photography. Can I just get like a thumbs up from somebody that you can see the screen okay? Yeah, you're good. All right, good, good, good. Okay, so just before we get into um, specifics, just to acclimate you to what you are seeing now, um, as I move around the imagery, please take note of the screen on the bottom, the, the map on the bottom right of the screen will indicate where we are at on the map and the direction that we are looking at with north being to the top, west, east, and south. Um, so we are now just south of Nablus looking directly to the west. And as I move the screen, you will see that the green cone, the triangle, will move uh, with it, indicating which direction we are looking at in the landscape. Uh, just to orient you to where we are, we are south of Nablus, that is directly north of Jerusalem along Route 60, that highway that we mentioned, okay, directly to the north, uh, uh, connecting us to Nablus. Now, I want to start by acknowledging that what I do not have <laughs> which is imagery of Chomesh, uh, which is currently in the news, uh, the illegal um, uh, outpost uh, uh, where there was a landmark uh, decision um, by the uh, current Knesset to repeal the disengagement law, allowing people to return to the area of Chomesh, an evacuated settlement that had been evacuated as part of the 2005 disengagement plan. Uh, there is a new effort um, to build uh, illegally without proper Israeli authorization. When I refer to illegal, 
outposts, I'm referring not to illegal in, uh, according to international law, where all settlements would be uh, are viewed um, as illegal according to international law, but illegal according to Israeli law, uh, meaning they were built without prior authorization. And the current situation of Homesh is a situation just to the northwest of Nablus. We can't see it here, but I want to highlight some areas just to give you a sense of what we're talking about. Uh, area A is the area of Nablus, the urban city center directly in front of us. You get a sense of what this looks like on the ground with Area B. Much of the area of Area B is in the uh, kind of suburbs surrounding the major population centers. Um, if we were to have a better image, and hopefully we will in the not distant future, um, you can see settlements highlighted in blue. Um, Homesh would be uh, in this area on the horizon, uh, northwest of Nablus and between Nablus and Janine. Um, and most in recent days, of course, uh, with great international opposition, um, settlers have established a sort of prefabricated building uh, on state land, not on private Palestinian land, as was previously the situation of Homesh. And I want to just take a moment to talk about the issue of land ownership, just in provide the context. In the in Area C of the West Bank, in that 60% of the West Bank, we have uh, what is referred to as state land and what is private Palestinian land. A private Palestinian land is perhaps very uh, understandable. Uh, it is privately owned land by individual Palestinians. State land is land that was controlled by the state during the Ottoman Empire's time uh, before World War I. Uh, it, that ownership of that land was transferred from the Ottomans to the British during the British mandate, from the British to the Jordanians, uh, between 49 and 67. And then when Israel uh, uh, takes control of the West Bank, uh, that state land that was Jordanian is now under uh, state land, uh, according to Israel. None of this land uh, has been annexed to the West Bank. East Jerusalem, which we'll get to in just a moment, is the only area post-67 that has been formally annexed uh, to Israel. Um, but for the purposes of zoning and planning, uh, it's important to note that area A and B, Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority, uh, according to Oslo, is um, responsible for things like civilian affairs, like zoning and planning, whereas area C, zoning and planning, is um, under the authority of the Israelis. And so when we come to the issue of area C, uh, zoning and uh, planning, uh, much of the what is referred to as legal uh, Israeli settlement construction in the West Bank is taking place on state land, not on private Palestinian land, but we have a number of uh, outposts, settlements that have been created, including most recently Homesh, which has been created with the acquiescence of the government, but not the clear authorization uh, to build, uh, construction, uh, construct uh, neighborhoods, homes uh, in areas without any government authorization, uh, and we have illegal outposts uh, now throughout the West Bank that have some that have been created on state land and some on private Palestinian land. And we'll talk a bit about more about that in just in just a moment. David, can you yes. also you might you, this might be part of what you're getting to as well, but can you talk a little bit about the difference between an outpost and a settlement? Sure. Um, so um, let's see, uh, we'll give an example. Um, and here is, uh, if I'm looking directly to the south, um, if we take a look at the roads in this area, we'll get a sense of, uh, in the distance, we can see Ariel. This is in the far distance over the horizon. It's actually quite a long settlement that you can't quite see from this vantage point. Um, Ariel is now a city of, I believe now, close to 30,000 people. Uh, it is a significant settlement um, uh, built with uh, the government's authorization. Um, and it is a, a, a very well-established now community, um, even though it has not formally been annexed to Israel. Um, you can take that versus uh, a place uh, like like this location, an illegal outpost that is near the settlement of Itamar. Now, the settlement of Itamar may be legal according to Israeli law and that it was built uh, with the authorization of the Israeli government. But you'll, what you'll often see when it comes to these outposts 
uh, is that they are close to an existing settlement and that that settlement's uh, uh, municipality essentially will use its resources um, to pave a road and to start actually building an illegal outpost that is adjacent to that settlement, but expands the overall footprint of that settlement, uh, often into a strategic location or often into an area to advance the idea of, of uh, expanding the territorial contiguity of uh, the settlement with the existing transportation infrastructure. And I'm gonna talk more about this issue of territorial contiguity, but essentially the main difference is the authorization uh, of, of the Israeli uh, government. Uh, I do want to note that you have some outposts that look like fully fledged neighborhoods that look no different than settlements. You have some outposts that are one individual with a tent and a few sheep uh, and everything in between. Uh, the issue of an illegal outpost can be something that, again, looks like a neighborhood or something that looks like uh, um, you know, someone who has just squatted in an area and who's refusing to leave. Um, you know, one of uh, typically uh, one of the very first things that are built in these illegal areas are things like um, schools or yeshivas, synagogues, um, because it is politically, emotionally uh, more challenging to uh, remove or destroy uh, something like a synagogue. And of course, the issue of Chomesh uh, today and the international outrage is the establishment of a yeshiva in Chomesh. Um, that they will undoubtedly seek to retroactively uh, legalize. And this is um, the current um, uh, concern with the current uh, extreme right-wing government has been the process of seeking to retroactively legalize uh, dozens and dozens of illegal outposts. Uh, reportedly, the current finance minister, Smotrich, would like to retroactively legalize as many of, as 70 illegal outposts uh, to make them legal according to Israeli law. Uh, and of course, a few months ago, they retroactively legalized nine such outposts. The first time such a dramatic measure was taken despite uh, significant international outrage. And I can tell you that Netanyahu's uh, response to the Americans is that, look, my coalition partners wanted me to legalize 70. I'm only legalizing nine. Uh, and his response to his coalition partners is, look, I have such international pressure. I'm not giving you nothing. Nine is unprecedented. And he's continuing to try to play a game between keeping his coalition partners happy and managing international opposition and outrage. But this issue of retroactively uh, legalizing these outposts is something that is going to come back again and again and again. And I wanna give one particular example in the example of Eviatar, which has really uh, symbolized this issue. Before we get to Eviatar, <laughs> I wanna just talk briefly about the issue of transportation. Can I, I'm gonna interrupt you really quick before you move on to transportation, because there's a question in the chat, which you, I think, half answered, but let's, let's uh, really put a finer point to it. So all outposts then are considered illegal under Israeli law, with the exception of those nine that were just legalized? Um, so yes, when I'm referring to outposts, I'm referring to things that have not been um, authorized by the Israeli government. Um, and so yes, there are still uh, dozens and dozens of uh, illegal outposts now throughout the West Bank. Um, some of them in more isolated areas, but most, or I would say many, are in this kind of dynamic that are satellite communities that are essentially a way of extending the existing footprint of a legal settlement according to Israeli law. I don't know if that helps answer that, that question. Okay. That's great. Let, let, let's talk a little, <laughs> little bit about transportation as we get to the question of Eviatar. Um, so uh, a uh, during the Oslo process, uh, what we see in front of us is Route 60. Um, as part of the Oslo process and the division into area A, B, and C, we have uh, a situation where, uh, if for those of you who have been to the West Bank, when you're about to enter into area A, you'll see a very large red sign that says entry is forbidden uh, to Israelis at risk of death. Um, and so a dilemma uh, emerges, um, which is, 
Um, you do not want Israeli traffic going into Palestinian population centers where the Palestinian Authority has full control. Uh, and yet um, there is still Israeli traffic uh, traversing the West Bank. Uh, and so what we've had is a series, a system of bypass roads that are now uh, established. Um, we can see Route 60 and its approach from the north to Nablus, and we can see how it turns into Nablus for Palestinian traffic and goes around Nablus for the Israeli traffic. If I go to the south of Nablus, we can see where that traffic converges with the Israeli traffic coming to the south the Palestinian traffic going to the south in this direction, and they meet at this point. This point is, uh, is uh, the Palestinian village of Hawara. And you may recall that just a few months ago, um, we had uh, first uh, was uh, an IDF operation in Nablus that had um, you know killed some nine uh, Palestinian militants, uh, and thereafter, there were two brothers who were residents of the Har Bracha settlement who were stuck in a traffic jam in Hawara. And first of all, you can understand the issue of a traffic jam. You have Palestinian traffic, you have Israeli traffic. They are converging in one spot where the road converges. It is the first place where Israeli and Palestinian traffic, Israelis and Palestinians are intermingling outside of the major city of Nablus. This is an area that has been the target of numerous attacks against Israelis by Palestinians over the years. Um, this is only the most recent, um, but it really uh, uh, demonstrates the unique dilemma and the challenge uh, between uh, uh, advancing a political uh, religious nationalist movement of the settlements versus providing for security. And here we have uh, a, a good example of that in Hawara. So first, um, this is not the first nor the last incident. Uh, a few months ago was not the first nor the last incident of violence in Hawara. And note that not only do we, is it a point of significant convergence of Israeli and Palestinian traffic, um, but it is also surrounded by some of the most extreme Israeli settlements and, uh, and many illegal outposts, uh, which of course we re recall the response to that terror attack was um, sort of uh, uh, unprecedented wave of settler violence rampaging through uh, the streets of Hawara, which again was not the first and hasn't been the last such incident of settler violence was an increasingly uh, concerning development across the West Bank. So we have the increasing concern of terrorism coming from Palestinians targeting Israeli civilians um, tied with settler violence. And much of it is happening here. And much of it is aided by the nature of the transportation infrastructure where we're faced with a traffic jam. So what is the solution? The solution that is being offered is yet another bypass road. And here I've moved from south of Nablus, just south of Hawara. And I wanna look back to Nablus and again, we'll look at Route 60. We'll see area A and B highlighted and the settlements in blue. And here is Nablus. The road should be highlighted in yellow, is not. The Palestinian traffic comes here. The Israeli traffic comes here. They converge on Hawara. And this is where the initial uh, incident took place. And of course, you could already see the infrastructure that has been laid for the bypass road, which will go around, uh, which will go around Hawara. Um, again, this will serve a security need of, of not having traffic converge into this uh, village, um, and yet it serves a national religious goal of improving the quality of life throughout the West Bank and strengthening the Israeli presence uh, in doing so. Um, and what we can see by that is how the road not only uh, goes around Hawara, but it will also serve um, uh, as a kind of uh, buffer preventing one Palestinian village from expanding into another. And we have this issue again of territorial contiguity, which I wanna come back to. But my basic point about the situation of Hawara is that today the budget was passed just a week ago in Israel that showed that despite the fact that the settlers in the West Bank are less than 5% of Israel's population, we have uh, an expectation or actually a budget that is now passed uh, where transportation resources of more than 
25% uh, of the money being allocated for new roads and, uh, and transportation infrastructure is in the West Bank, where we have less than 5% of the population, laying the foundation to address issues like this, yes, but also to dramatically improve the roads accessing settlements throughout the West Bank, preparing for their future uh, growth and development. And we're now in a moment where we have the finance minister Smotrich and others in the government that are not shy as they may have been in the past about their goals, but are very openly describing uh, these kinds of measures as the first steps towards doubling the population of the settlements in the West Bank, something that I am uh, remain dubious they will be able to do, which I'm happy to describe why in just a moment. Uh, I want to pause before I get to this story of Eviatar and another example of the illegal outpost question. If there's any questions or comments. There's a comment, but I'm going to I'm going to turn it into a question for you. And I think that you'll probably kind of get, if, if this is something that we can touch on throughout as well, which is the question of like, you know, when, when, when the settle, settlement movement first started after 67, it was largely uh, at least um, at least uh, said out loud that it was predominantly for security reasons. And a lot of the things that you're talking about today obviously have security implications as well. And we do obviously have to consider the very real threat um, of terrorism. And so I'm wondering, you know, where is, uh, where is that line or kind of what do you see as the difference? Or can you talk to us a little bit about what are legitimate security concerns and what are, and I think this is kind of what you're getting to in terms of maximum territorial contigu contiguity. Yeah, um, if you look at the evolution of the settlement movement over time or the evolution of how the Israeli government has treated the situation in the West Bank, you can see a tr transition from uh, a real focus on security. In the days after the 67 war, the idea was to strengthen uh, Israeli security presence, particularly in the Jordan Valley, uh, in an area that was on the border of uh, a, a hostile country that it had just had a war with, right? Um, you had the questions of how do you safeguard the approach to Jerusalem, uh, which had been this vulnerable, narrow corridor to the capital city, and creating a presence around the capital city um, was primarily, uh, at least initially, driven by security uh, concerns in mind. Um, but there was an initial goal in the days after the 67 not to promote settlements in this area along Route 60, uh, in the northern and southern West Banks because of the recognition um, that it would essentially uh, um, intermingle the populations, making them uh, uh, difficult uh, to have a, a future potential political uh, settlement, but also the vast expenditure of, of security resources that now need to be placed in these areas uh, to protect these settlements. It's only uh, over time into the 70s and particularly the early 80s uh, with the Begin government and the plans of Ariel Sharon that we see a, a completely different uh, view, which is to say that there is a national religious goal to settle in the historic places of ancient Israel, of Judea and Samaria. And the idea was rather than to avoid settling in these areas, the idea was actually to control Route 60 to control this major highway, because if you can control Route 60, you can essentially control the populations in the West Bank. You can close down a Palestinian city if you need to, uh, if you're able to control Route 60. Now, I would argue, and I know that many, many, many Israeli security officials who've been in positions of controlling the West Bank uh, for years and years and years, um, would argue that the expenditure of the IDF manpower and resources uh, to safeguard an incredibly small and increasingly radical population, particularly in areas the closest uh, to Palestinian population centers and those engaged in settler violence and the rest, are sapping the energy of the IDF from other legitimate uh, security threats. There is without question a major security threat and it is a multi-layered one, um, but deeply enmeshing uh, a ideologically hardened Israeli population uh, alongside uh, Palestinian populations that deeply uh, are, are hardened against their presence is a recipe for more expenditure of IDF resources. And sadly, um, 
the greater likelihood of friction and violence. Um, and so while settlements are not the only issue of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, um, it certainly is exacerbating the situation on the ground and exacerbating the ability um, for the Israelis um, uh, to be able to provide security for Israeli civilians who are living there, frankly. Um, and uh, uh, and um, we have some resources on our website that talk about the, uh, the level and the expenditure uh, that the IDF has to go to protect these areas. Um, and that is uh, a, a, of growing concern. So I am going to just turn for a moment to the issue of Aviatar. Um, and just again, as an example, uh, of the issues of illegal outposts. Here we have Tapuach Junction, uh, an interchange uh, uh, along Route 60, a site of numerous terrorist attacks against Israeli motorists over the year, over the years. In, in, uh, it was in the memory of one of the victims of terrorism that this illegal outpost, uh, Eviatar, was established along um, this highway that you can see that is a east to west corridor along the northern west bank if we can see where we are at north of jerusalem uh, and along uh, uh, route five that passes this road passes uh, in this direction to ariel and in this direction uh, to the jordan valley and what we can see is that in this case this is not a satellite illegal outpost but one that was established with a very clear strategy in mind, which is to disrupt Palestinian contiguity from one village to the next and to control the highway, okay? And to control access to the highway between them. Uh, Eviatar is an example of a famous Supreme Court case uh, where part of Eviatar was built on private Palestinian land and part on state land. There was a deal hatched with the Israeli government um, that if it was determined to be on state land, they'd allow a yeshiva to be built there. Uh, of course, it was determined that it was partially on Palestinian land and partially on state land. Uh, and this has become another sort of uh, rallying cause of the settlement movement to develop Eviatar. In fact, you had a march there about a month ago uh, from activists who marched from Hawara uh, to Eviatar. And I think this is another issue that we'll see uh, causing a lot of international attention um, in, the, in the near future is the likely establishment um, or, and efforts to, to legalize uh, and solidify a yeshiva in Eviatar. Uh, but this is an example not of the kind of satellite outpost that we were referring to earlier, but one that's built uh, uh, in a very uh, strategic location in mind. But again, the key is to disrupt Palestinian contiguity on the one hand, and control access to major uh, highways uh, on the other. Uh, and that is uh, really um, seen in the example of Eviatar. I would like to move to Jerusalem if there's any questions before I do. Okay. I'm just wondering, you haven't mentioned that the road system is divided and that, you know, the people the, the Israelis control their own road. I mean, they have their own road system on which Palestinians are not allowed to drive. And uh, that is uh, a very difficult, that makes life very difficult for Palestinians who have to drive miles around to get to wherever they need to go because they cannot use the road system that goes, you know, directly to places. So their, their, their villages are all segregated from the each other they can't get to them easily so sometimes they have to go for hours to get around yeah so we'll see that a bit more in just a moment when we go to jerusalem uh, but we did refer to the issue of the bypass roads um, before how israeli traffic is going around those palestinian uh, population centers and of course um, a lot of those roads that we saw before accessing settlements and uh, a numerous outposts are, are roads that um, it is correct that Palestinians are not accessing. Um, I wanna go to some of the issues that are in the news in Jerusalem. We have about 20 minutes. I want to, again, I'm giving kind of a high level review 
of, of some of the issues. But if we go to Jerusalem, I think that today we can classify some of the more controversial issues as being of um, two concentric kind of circles of challenges. Um, and I'm gonna focus on the outer challenge. Uh, just to give you the context, we're looking over the old city. We can see when we were, I was referring to that security challenge in the days after the 67 war, um, there's a very clear security challenge in the narrow corridor approaching the city uh, where you have from the Southern to Northern point of the Green Line, a distance of only some four miles. The goal uh, was to widen uh, this corridor um, in part by the way in which the Jerusalem municipal boundary was drawn, uh, which expanded uh, the city limits, uh, expanded the, the, uh, that, that corridor approaching the city. But if, if we were to superimpose uh, a map onto the image that we're looking at now, we'd see that in the horizon to the north is Modi'in Elite, the largest ultra-Orthodox settlement in the West Bank, very close to the Green Line that is here to the Northwest. We'd see Beitar Elite in, as part of the Gush Etzion block of settlements to the Southwest, the second largest settlement, also ultra-Orthodox. Um, both communities, the fastest growing settlements in the West Bank, very close to the Green Line, long considered to be part of Israel in any future negotiation, but they are rapidly increasing the number of settlers because of the rapid birth rate of the ultra-Orthodox. So we'd see that to the, to the, to the Northwest and to the Southwest. And behind us is Ma'abe Adumim, the third largest settlement. The three largest settlements in the West Bank today essentially form a triangle, which we'd refer to as the Greater Jerusalem Triangle, that serve to essentially surround uh, Jerusalem. And there is an argument that by doing so, you're widening the corridor and you're surrounding the capital city. That serves, um, in one argument, a security interest of fortifying the capital. And on the, on another, it serves as the interest of fortifying the capital, ensuring that it would not be divided as part of a future peace agreement, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Um, if we are to talk about the inner and outer circles that I'm referring to, um, the first inner circle of challenge is in and around the old city, where we have a whole variety of issues I'm not going to talk about in great detail today. Um, but if you think about the issue of Sheikh Jarrah, this is happening right outside the old city walls here, um, the uh, uh, dispute over land ownership. Uh, that was uh, partly responsible for the spark and violence between Israel and Hamas in May, or it was an instigator, I'd say, uh, or an excuse for Hamas to be in firing rockets in May of 2021, uh, right outside the old city. We have a variety of controversies in the Holy Basin directly below us uh, with um, allocation of resources, including in the last budget, to organizations that are seeking to um, develop archaeological sites with uh, uh, Jewish history in mind uh, and with a very uh, clear um, political goal uh, to emphasize the Jewish connection to the land um, with surrounding controversies, particularly in the areas of Silwan, just outside of the old city, uh, where we have controversies related to archaeological digs underneath Palestinian homes. We have land ownership issues, uh, eviction issues, uh, illegal Palestinian building facing uh, demolition orders and the like uh, in these areas. Uh, in the areas of Batan al Hawa, we have areas of radical settlers uh, who are taking over uh, buildings in the middle of uh, overwhelming Palestinian neighborhoods, um, uh, uh, you know, with private security and the like, creating frictions here, sort of around, you can almost map the areas of tensions around the old city as part of essentially uh, uh, a microcosm over the fight over territorial contiguity that we see throughout the West Bank. In this case, it's a, a question of territorial access uh, and proximity to the old city. Um, but the external circle of challenge is a reflection of the long strategy I referred to before of creating a contiguous ring around the city of Jerusalem. Uh, and we have issues both to the north, to the east, and to the south. I'm going to start off in the north, and I'm going to try to touch on each one of these issues rather quickly. 
The first is the current plan to build some 10,000 homes for ultra-Orthodox here in Atarot. Atarot is the abandoned airport uh, that we see below us. Um, this is an airport that was functional up until uh, really uh, the second intifada. Um, but today we can see in front of us these very tall buildings. This is the neighborhood of Kufar Aqab in front of us, uh, one of the fastest growing neighborhoods in Jerusalem today. If we were to see the Jerusalem municipal boundary, it would cut across where my cursor is at the moment. We have about 100,000 or so residents in this Palestinian neighborhood. That is the fastest growing because all of these buildings have been built without proper authorization, without proper building codes. Um, and it is uh, on the wrong side of the security barrier, which you could see in, in front of us, but within the Jerusalem municipal boundary. That means that because it's on the far side of the fence, it is getting few municipal services from Jerusalem. Uh, there is not a police force here, uh, for example, and yet you, they are also not receiving basic services or security from the Palestinian Authority, which does not have authorization to go here. So this is effectively no man's land. Um, why is it growing so rapidly? And we can see that it's growing so rapidly with the high rises that go right up next to the fence, which was only built uh, after the second intifada. In the last 15 years, these buildings have been built. Uh, again, without proper code, and it's unclear if there was an earthquake in this area like there was recently in Turkey that these buildings would survive. Um, it is growing rapidly because Palestinians very much want to maintain their Jerusalem residency status. By having their permanent residency, they are not citizens of Israel, but they are able to travel and work freely inside Israel without the need to get a permit like their Palestinian uh, colleagues, uh, friends, family, what have you, in the rest of the West Bank. Kufar Aqab is an increasingly attractive place to be because it's somewhere where there is available housing because these high rises are being built without proper code. It is also providing access for West Bank Palestinians who might be married to the Jerusalemites to have a place that is sort of in the in-between zone between the West Bank and Jerusalem. Uh, and that allows the Jerusalem residents to have that free access to the job market inside of Israel. Um, notably, because they must main, they're doing, they're living in these areas to maintain the Jerusalem residency status. They're actually paying property taxes, even though they're not receiving full municipal services. Um, they're paying property taxes because that proves that they are Jerusalem residents. Um, so why do I give you all of this context? Because we have this fast and growing overcrowded community and we have this large area right next to it on the other side of the fence. And you can see here, the Kalandia checkpoint. This is the checkpoint that all the residents of this neighborhood and all uh, West Bank residents will have to pass through with work permits in, in order to enter into uh, Jerusalem from the north. Um, but I mention all this context because there are plans here to build now 10,000 homes for the ultra-Orthodox. Uh, this plan has been stalled amidst international pressure. It was, uh, the official word is that it's being reviewed for environmental purposes before it goes through. Um, but because this is not in the West Bank, it's in Jerusalem, which has been annexed to Israel, there is not the same procedural process to advance this uh, housing development. And it could in theory be advanced far quicker than other settlements in the West Bank. There is strong international opposition. And there's some belief that there, this project will not go forward um, because it's simply so impractical from a security standpoint to put Israeli uh, civilians within such close proximity to a Palestinian neighborhood that essentially has no security presence whatsoever. Um, and so from a simple security standpoint, this is on its face a bit ridiculous, uh, but it's important to note that even according to the Trump administration, when it put forward its plan uh, for an Israeli-Palestinian agreement or a Palestinian deal of the century, uh, the Trump administration envisioned that this abandoned airport would be part of the Palestinian capital uh, and would actually be turned into a tourism center for the state of Palestine. And so this plan to build a ultra-Orthodox neighborhood uh, uh, actually runs counter to even the Trump administration's vision um, for um, the, the so-called uh, deal of the century, and is one that I think will return to the news in uh, near term, should it be uh, uh, advanced in any way. The next spot I want to go, and in, in this sort of whirlwind of controversial spots, 
uh, is going to be east of Jerusalem, where we can see uh, the story of E1. First, I want to go back to Mount of Olives to just give a sense of the direction. If we're looking from Mount of Olives directly to the east, we can see in front of us the Jerusalem municipal boundary. This is the area annexed to Israel. Everything beyond the Purple Line is the West Bank. And here we can see um, the situation directly to the east. First, I want to note that Abu Dis is here, um, just beyond the boundaries of uh, East Jerusalem, uh, directly to the east. You may have seen in the news just last week, there was an effort to build to establish uh, a, a building where 400 Israelis uh, are looking to live in Abu Dis. You'll notice this is area B, where Palestinians have civilian control. Why would Palestine, where Israelis want to live in Abu Dis? The resident of the people promoting this idea of having Israelis move into Abu Dis have said that because it has in the past been considered to be a potential location for a Palestinian capital or a capital of a Palestinian state, they want to establish a Jewish presence there to remove it from consideration of being a potential capital. Now, I should say the Palestinians have long rejected the idea of Abu Dis as a capital. Abu Dis like Atarot, is under the Trump plan, supposed to be part of a future Palestinian capital, again, under the Trump vision. Um, but just in the last week, we've seen uh, a movement by some of the more radical settlers to begin to basically start living directly in a Palestinian village uh, in order to essentially take it off the political map. But what we see in front of us is the settlement of Ma'ale Adumim. We can see Route 1 accessing Ma'ale Adumim, the issue of E1 the long stalled project uh, with great international opposition is basically everything between the purple line of the Jerusalem Missile Boundary and Ma'ale Adumim. And more recently, we had an individual ask the question about the, the road system. More recently, we've seen uh, plans to advance a road that would essentially take Palestinian traffic from Ramallah in the north uh, and would actually bypass this corridor of Ma'ale Adumim and E1 uh, connect Abu Dis. Uh, uh, it would be a, a road that would take go from Abu Dis uh, and connect um, uh, to Azaim and then further up into Ramallah. Um, the goal of this road is multifaceted. Um, on the one hand, it is called a fabric of life road because it would dramatically improve Palestinian traffic flows from Ramallah in the north to Bethlehem in the south. Others have recalled it a sovereignty road because it would divert Palestinian traffic from having to access these roads in the areas of Ma'ale Adumim. And when you can divert tra Palestinian traffic from Ma'ale Adumim, it would allow for the removal of the checkpoint that is here uh, uh, on the road from Ma'ale Adumim to Jerusalem, giving the residents of Ma'ale Adumim the impression that they are essentially within Israel proper, that they are not living in the West Bank. And it would, by removing Palestinian traffic from the area of this corridor, it would remove uh, uh, any security uh, uh, obstacle to developing E1 exclusively for the benefit of Israelis. Now, what we see with the situation of E1 is a very, very classic story of contiguity. I know we're running out of time, but I'll just perhaps end with this, even though there's like three other things I'd love to share. But uh, <laughs> uh, here we have an issue of uh, East Jerusalem, Palestinian neighborhoods. You can see the Palestinian villages of area B in the outskirts of the city. Um, and you can see that this area, this open area um, can, only, can only be one of two things. It can either be an area that provides for future expansion of Palestinian villages that are essentially territorial territorially linked with the Palestinian villages in East Jerusalem, with the neighborhoods in East Jerusalem. In other words, it's, it's land for the expansion of those Palestinian communities, or it's going to serve as land that connects Ma'ale Adumim to the Jerusalem city limits for Israeli Jewish construction. So this is essentially the question of future territorial contiguity. If this area is developed by Israel for uh, settlement construction, 
The argument is that it essentially bisects the West Bank into Northern and Southern sections. And today, uh, the situation on the ground uh, looks like this, and I'll end with this. The situation when we actually go to, to that area, we can see that the area of E1 already has infrastructure laid for building, but it has looked like this for about 17 years. It has been frozen uh, looking like this with all of the infrastructure laid, but no actually building established uh, due to international opposition. The only thing that's built here in E1 is the main headquarters for the Israeli police in the West Bank, the Judea and Samaria division of the Israel police, but nothing has been built here. And part of the goal of building this road system to divert Palestinian traffic from this area uh, would be again, to essentially turn this area into a true suburb of Jerusalem uh, with the feeling of a full annexed area to Jerusalem. Uh, and again, um, I, I think that both in the transportation budget that we've seen and some of the explicit goals of the current government, this is an issue that we're likely to see in the not distant future uh, uh, come up once, once again. Um, perhaps I will stop there. If there's any other questions? So there's that, one final, there's one final question here, uh, which I think is a really interesting one. Are the Palestinians building strategic roads in their territories? And if not, why? It's a great question. Um, so not really. Um, part of the reason is there is no territorial contiguity for the Palestinians to build the strategic roads. So what do I mean by that? If I were to go to the original two-dimensional map that I showed at the beginning, we can see the area in orange, area B, and the areas in red, area A. That's where the Palestinian Authority has control of civilian matters, zoning and planning, or things like building roads, for example. But what we can see is that Area B actually is, when connected with Area A, there's not one area that is Area A and B, and it's not contiguous. There's 169 islands of Area B in the ocean of Area C, okay, in the 60% Area C. So in many cases, the roads that are needed for Palestinians are actually roads that connect these islands right, is an infrastructure to connect Palestinian communities, but to do so means to build roads that cross Area C, which it is subject to Israeli authority, Israeli zoning and planning. So a lot of those questions of where there could or should be roads uh, is again subject to Israeli authorization and approval. Um, there have been some instances, uh, there was once, for example, uh, a big debate. We don't have this debate so much anymore, given the deterioration of Israeli-Palestinian relations. Um, but at one point, there was a debate over policing in Area B, where the Palestinian Authority was and was not sending their police. And the Israelis said, we'll let you, there, there's not, there are many areas of Area B that are in these islands where there's no Palestinian police force. The Israelis are not going in there. So you have large segments of the Palestinian population that actually don't have basic law and order, right? No actual policing. And so one of the ideas uh, was, well, you'll, you'll build new police stations in some of the areas of Area B. And the Palestinians argued, no, no, we don't need more police stations. We just need the roads to be able to access those areas of Area B. Um, we need to be able to, because what the problem was is for Israel, for Palestinian police to access a village that requires them to cross Area C, Israeli controlled territory, they need to first call to get permission from the IDF to enter and to exit, of course. And to do so dramatically reduces any sort of emergency response time, of course. So one proposal was we'll build new police stations and the Palestinians said, no, we don't need more stations. We just need access to the roads. And again, this question of who is controlling Area C 
uh, is today the fundamental question of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict when it comes to an issue of territorial contiguity and the settlement movement, which is the idea of Oslo was that area C was a, an area A and area B were all transitional designations, that there would be an end of conflict agreement in five years, and that the area C was not to be annexed to Israel, but was under Israeli control until there was a permanent status uh, agreement. And essentially, uh, what the settlement movement now is uh, very clearly uh, seeking is to take Area C and fully annex it to Israel. And so anything, including giving access to Palestinians to use roads, um, is viewed as, uh, uh, as giving the Palestinians uh, portions of Area C and relinquishing Israel's sovereignty over Area C and is very much uh, opposed by um, the far right and the settlement movement in particular. So this issue of transportation, access, roads, and expansion of communities and illegal building. I'm a little over time, but I'll just say that these designations were established in 1995. That was a very long time ago now. And you have in many areas, Palestinian villages that have begun to seep beyond the limits of area B and expand into what is on the map, area C, where technically they'd be subject to an Israeli permit to be able to build those communities or those homes. And so Palestinians were virtually impossible for them to get such a permit, have numerous structures that have been built on area C land that not according, not with, or they have been built in area C without authorization, just like the illegal outposts. And so what the Israel settlement movement has argued is that there is a Palestinian takeover of area C that must be stopped and that the opposition to illegal outposts um, is misguided and that the real illegal construction that is the problem at the heart of the conflict is the Palestinian construction, the illegal construction, okay? Um, and this issue of Area C, uh, uh, construction rights, um, access to land and transportation are issues that are playing out in real time and are gonna be exacerbated, I'm sorry to say, by the most recent uh, budget that has been passed. Um, I hope this is given some context, but I'm happy to take any questions. Stick around. I know we're out of time, but thanks for listening. Awesome. Thanks so much, David. Uh, let me just do this here. Okay. Yes. Thank you so much, David. It was so great to have you here today. I will say, I think this is my third or fourth virtual tour that I've done with you, and there's never enough time. So one day we're going to do like a three hour marathon virtual tour. <laughs> um, You're going to have to. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us for staying a couple of minutes after after time. I'm just going to give a uh, quick spiel as I do at, at the end of all of our webinars. We will be sending out a recording after this, uh, as well as just a kind of thank you email and any any comments that you have. We don't send out formal surveys or anything like that, but any comments that you have, any questions, any suggestions for upcoming events that you want to see, just shoot us an email right back to that. We always love to hear from you, and we love to hear your suggestions. And finally. JSpace Canada is an entirely all volunteer run organization. We try to do these events at least once a month because we feel that this information is really important and really lacking within our community. If you appreciate these events, if you want to see more of them, I highly encourage you to make a donation to JSpace Canada, jspacecanada.ca slash donate, very easy. If you make your donation monthly, it's even more helpful because it means that we can plan to do these events monthly uh, without, <laughs> without the stress of worrying about how we're actually going to fund that. So again, thank you so much, everyone, for your time. Thank you for joining us month, every month when we do this. And thank you so much, Israel Policy Forum, for all your support, uh, your partnership, and of course, your amazing resources. Thanks, everybody. Bye.